Hello, I'm Luke Coddy, and you're listening to the Kill Jump Podcast. On today's episode, the final one of the year, we need a headliner. And we've got ourselves Tim Bloomer, Kill Jump Area Sales Manager. See, Tim, it's Christmas, so no mean jokes this time. I think it's more a case of you wanted a headliner and you couldn't find one, so you chose me. <laughs> this is the third in the series, so stop and go back if you're not listening to the other ones. Only joking, these are pretty non linear. We're practically Pulp Fiction around here. Um, that's as topical as my film references get, I'm afraid. Tim's resume as well as featuring the police work, which we found out last time, which definitely makes him a tad scarier, also features 24 years in the industry. Over that time, he has developed a real interest in the insect side of pest control. Whilst dealing with insect control, Tim is aided by his level of technical knowledge and transfers that into the detective skills needed on site. Detective Bloomer, I guess that makes me your sidekick. Yeah, Luke, I have to point out at this stage, I never actually got into the police force. Oh, no, don't um, spoil the illusion. But... But it is good to know that you find me more scary as a result, so that's all right. Did your criminal record flag you up as uh, Tim? Uh... It did indeed, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so these are the tales from the unexpected, um, centering around insects. Tim, what are we talking about today? We're going to talk about the tropical warehouse moss, Luke, Festia Cortella. Uh, and again, giving people the information of how to identify them, a bit about the life cycle. And then uh, a little anecdote at the end, just to uh, finish off my time on the podcast. Uh, we're definitely getting back, don't worry, everyone. In the last two of these, on the early two of the series, we talked about the importance of insect identification. So why don't we start there with the tropical warehouse moth? Yeah, and again, it comes back to breeding sites and all that sort of thing, Luke. So um, the tropical warehouse moth, um, again, it's a difficult one to identify. And as with all moth species, true identification requires a study of the adult characteristics, um, which will include wing venation, head appendages, and abdominal structures. So you're looking at really detailed key features here, which you need a, a really good microscope for. So the key message, as always, is get them identified correctly by an entomologist. And from there, once you've got it identified as a tropical warehouse moth, then you can start looking for the breeding sites. Uh, if we're looking to give people sort of tips and hints and tips they can use in the field, uh, the adult moth is around about 18 mil in length um, uh, with a wingspan that's very similar. So 12 to 18 mil wingspan. But they're a fairly nondescript greyish moth. I'm probably going to get loads of abuse for describing moths as nondescript now, aren't I? Mm. Um, but they're a great, they're a greyish moth, and they have a pattern, um, a, a two bands across their wings. But it's a similar story to the Indian meal moth, where that pattern can be a bit misleading because it is made up of very small, tiny scales, and as the, the moth moves around and flies around, very often those scales fall off and may be lost. And so that pattern, that coloration. Um, does make it a little bit difficult to identify this particular moth. The other stage that people will come across is quite clearly the larval stage. Um, a decent sized larvae, this 14 mil in length when fully mature. Again, they're very similar to lots of other moth larvae, Luke, in that they're creamy white in colour. It's got a brown head uh, and they do tend to have some brown body markings. So that might be something that you know helps people a little bit. And then just a general sort of uh, little bit of help for people in terms of distinguishing fly larvae from moth and beetle larvae. Um, fly larvae tend not to have legs or don't have legs. Uh, and so when you see this, this larvae, it's going to have three pairs of jointed legs at the front. And these will become, obviously become the legs of the adult uh, moth. Um, and that identifies moth and beetle from fly larvae. Um, and then on this one, you're looking for five pairs of abdominal prolegs, which help it move around. Lovely stuff. As always, we talk about the need to identify the breeding site and locate it. Um, how could you help go about that? Well, again, we're, we're looking at a store product insect. Um, so this, this is the common theme amongst all of these podcasts that we've been recording. And store product insects, you're looking for stored food commodities. Again, very small quantities in domestic kitchens, perhaps, through to large quantities in bigger wet food storage warehouses and production facilities. Um, it has to be said at this point that, in actual fact, the tropical warehouse moth is probably the most common moth that gets imported into the UK on food products. Mm. Um, and therefore, it's, this is one that is, you know, it's hitching a ride on imports of food from abroad. However, it 
it only really gets established in buildings that are heated within the UK. So it's quite susceptible to cooler temperatures. Um, but it's going to attack a wide range of products. It starts with dried fruits, vegetables, nuts and pulses, those sorts of foodstuffs. And because it's a moth, it's going to spin webbing. It's going to create frass and webbing that's going to contaminate the food. And of course, what goes in one end must come out the other. So you've got food being contaminated with excre- excretia as well. I hope no pest controls are on their lunch while I listen to this, uh, this episode. <laughs> okay, Tim, once you've identified and located it, what is the treatment? Well, not surprisingly for those that have already listened to the other two podcasts, uh, it's very much find the, um, the breeding site and remove it, quarantine it, best case scenario, destroy it. And so if you think about an insect that's being uh, brought in on um, imported goods, you could be talking about many pallets of infested um, uh, food product here that needs to be destroyed. And that's a tough message to get across to any any customer um, who is losing money on that. Once you've got rid of that, you've isolated it and it's, it's been taken out of the building, then you need to start and look for any residual webbing and larvae that may be in the surrounding location and they can be removed through vacuuming. And then the final bit of this, of course, is to deal with any adult moth, either through residual insecticide spray treatments, or again, where you've got bigger premises, perhaps consider using fogging as a a, a preferred method of application. Bearing in mind, once again, that you do need to make sure you're not going to contaminate food with that insecticide. So how long are these processes then? How long can these treatment last for? How long is a piece of string with a treatment? Um, I mean, clearly, if you can get rid of the the food materials that are causing the, the problem through the breeding site, then you're breaking the back of it very, very quickly. Um, if you think that the whole cycle uh, from egg to adult can be as short as four weeks, um, extending up to generally a maximum of 16 weeks, um, if you can get rid of that breeding site straight away, then the adult moths aren't living very long. So you can break it in a matter of days, if not a couple of weeks. Um, If you don't get rid of that breeding site or you don't find that breeding site immediately and and deal with it straight away, then these treatments could be going on for months. It's funny how you bring up the perils to war there, like this idea of starving them out and just sort of giving them a lack of provisions and it just so quickly just gets rid of them. Are you sure you don't, you're not itching to get back into the police again, Tim? No, (laughs) definitely not. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely not. I'd much prefer being in this industry, Luke. Th- these pests can't kill me. <laughs> so, yet. Um, so <laughs> we uh, let's get to the anecdote then. Uh, what is the final tale you unexpected involving the tropical warehouse moth? Well, this is one, again, this is a domestic premises again. And this is one I've actually um, dealt with through providing uh, one of my current customers some support. And that's something, obviously, that killed Jim. I'm very good at is is our field based staff going out and helping customers with these investigations and providing that second pair of eyes. So this is a very large country house um, overlooking a valley. You know, very very smart property um, with a reasonable sized kitchen, and off of that you've got a oak beamed dining room, stroke conservatory, and immaculately clean. Uh, one has to say, but the the Pest controller had been in there. He, he correctly identified um, tropical warehouse moth, actually, and was just struggling to figure out where they were coming from because he'd done a thorough, detailed inspection of the kitchen. No foodstuffs in there that were infested. Um, and so we arranged to, to go off and see him and see the customer uh, and cast a second pair of eyes over it. And there was really nothing unusual about this place whatsoever, other than the fact it had quite a large population of adult tropical warehouse moth. And they were beginning to migrate into adjoining rooms. So clearly a concern for the, the owner of the house. Um, like I say, we got a correct ID, ID on them. Uh, and so we undertook another detailed inspection, looking for food debris more than anything, because the food storage cupboards were absolutely immaculately clean. Everything was stored in plastic containers. There was just nowhere in that food cupboard for these moths to breed. Further inspection, we were looking under the plinths, under the kitchen cupboards, um, down the side of the arga for food debris, all these sorts of things. And there was absolutely nothing. So, you know, if I had some hair, I'd probably have started pulling it out at this point. But um, I'm slightly challenged in that respect. And then we started to think about, okay, 
uh, are we looking at this as a food source through human eyes rather than looking at it from a moth's point of view? And what else is there in this location that perhaps we're missing? Um, and then out of the corner of my eye, I happened to notice one of what turned out to be four pyramids, if you like, a bit like a Ferrero Rocher tower, but they were made of um, ornamental dried oranges and lemons. They're purely for decorative reasons. Um, so we wouldn't see it as a food source, but of course, to those moth larvae, it's a wonderful place to breed. We did, after a brief conversation with a the customer, they were lucky enough they got some, some spare rooms outside in some of the outbuildings. So we were able to get these things moved outside uh, into these spare rooms. They were covered in polythene sheet just to keep the temperature up and encourage uh, the moth to carry on developing. It quickly became apparent over the next few weeks that actually they were the cause of the problem because the moths in the house clearly died off. There was no further um, reproduction in the house, so there was no further adult moths coming through. But actually, when we went back to look underneath the polythene sheet, then there were lots of moths now in this outbuilding. So again, no, no chemical treatment required in this one, Luke. It was just a case of identifying the breeding site and get rid of these very um, ornate oranges and lemons. I love how you showed your, uh, your class there by talking about Towers of Frere Rochers, Tim. Well, you know, I'm partial to a chocolate or two and I love hazelnuts, Luke, so why not? It is Christmas after all. I have to say, I think you're trying to weasel yourself a Christmas present from me there, Tim. For all, the, for all these appearances, I think you deserve one to be completely Well, honest. you know, what, what, they, what they say about the impossible and miracles. <laughs> the impossible we can do at once, miracles take a bit longer, than it? Or something, something like that. So uh, what's your favourite insect then, Tim? And what, What's your sort of most challenging insect you've had to deal with out on the out on site? Most challenging insects uh, would probably be pharaoh's ants. Um, okay. Because of, because of the nature of the beast, the way in which they can uh, colonies can separate and bud uh, and spread very quickly, and the fact that it's it's quite a prolonged treatment, and of course, in bad examples uh, for the customer, it's a very very expensive treatment, and therefore trying to persuade a customer they've got to spend you know potentially several thousand pounds to get rid of something um, is a bit of a challenge. In terms of my favourite insect. Well, I think those that know me well probably know I'm going to say the very carpet beetle. Um, and that's, if I'm, you know, if I'm being slightly mercenary here, I suppose, from a, a selling point of view and a sale, you know, when I was a surveyor and that sort of thing, it was a, a fairly straightforward, easy route to making money. Lovely stuff. I'm about to say the, uh, the pharaoh ants must be expensive at your prices, Tim. Um, it, it's worth, uh, any treatment is worth what it's worth to the customer. It's all about risk and reward, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you very much for joining us. I do really appreciate it. Um, That's a pleasure, Luke. Always a pleasure to talk to you, you know that. Uh, and this is the final one of the year. We'll be back monthly next year. I won't leave them right until the end. And I'm sure when, once Tim is twiddling his thumbs, he'll be desperate to get back on. So we'll, we might let him at some point next year. Perhaps we'll have a vote on it from, from our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All two of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I'd still come out naught too. <laughs> And, and just to finish off, Luke, can I just wish all of our customers a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year? That's it. Everyone stay safe out there and we'll be back next year. Thanks, Tim. Cheers. For those of you with basis prompt, to get your CPD points for this episode, the code you'll need is Papa Echo November Golf Uniform India November. A relatively festive code for you this time. Thank you all for listening. Have a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.